to Rochester Hills Library, too, for having me. Can you all hear me okay? All right, great. Uh, so I, the reason that I'm offering this workshop, and I've done it several times at libraries all over the state, is because I've written a little bit of my own family history, and I found it amazingly satisfying and rewarding. I've written a lot of other things, and nothing really struck me the way that writing about my own family history did. And just to give you a brief uh, kind of overview of where I'm coming from, I am what you would call an unlikely memoirist. I went to Michigan State and got a degree in journalism. And when I graduated in 1984, there weren't a lot of journalism jobs here in Michigan, kind of similar to what it's like today without the internet. And so my placement office got me one interview. And it was at a small 200-year-old family-owned, ununionized newspaper on the seacoast of New Hampshire. I had never been to New Hampshire. But I had student loans and a rickety car, which I got behind the wheel and drove out there and did the interview, and I was hired. So um, I didn't write the feature stories that I thought I was going to write. I didn't write the um, like school reports and things like that, gardening news and nature stories. They hired me as the police reporter. And I ended up absolutely loving it. So I worked there for six years, and I covered everything from a murder-suicide to a huge New Hampshire snowstorm when the dog cup catcher ran down two white show dogs in a snowstorm. So that was, that was front page news right there. Uh, so I loved that kind of work. And when I left there to raise my family, I started writing true crime books. I put my journalism degree and my journalism training, my police reporter training to work writing true crime books. When Evil Came to Good Heart came out in 2008, and it's about a family that was killed in 1968 in Good Heart, still unsolved. There were six of them, four children, two adults. They were from Lakeford Village. The second book is called Isidore's Secret, and it's about a nun who disappeared in 1907. It turned out she was buried in the dirt floor basement of the church disappeared for 12 years. They eventually found her. And back then, anything went in a uh, trial situation, and they actually laid the bones out of trial. Fascinating story. So that's the kind of stuff I did. I thought I was doing serious journalism. I thought I was uncovering stories that had never been told before. And I also freelanced for some pretty big papers, like the Boston Globe. I had a couple of Sunday uh, editorials in the free press. That, that was me. That was the kind of stuff I did. So I was approached in Traverse City by our prosecutor, a man named Stu Hubble. And he said, I've read your other books, and boy, do I have the case for you. And just briefly, it was about five men who all went to prison for murder. And the only, they, were, they were eventually exonerated, and the only reason they went to prison was because a witness came forward and said, I saw the whole thing happen. I will testify. She did. He put her on the stand and then went to prison, and only later did we find out that she had been in and out of 11 mental institutions before she ever took the stand. So that's what I was working on, and I thought it was a national story. My first two crime books came out, and they were regional stories, and so I started looking for a literary agent. And that took a while, but I eventually found an agent, and the only reason anybody was interested in my writing beyond the boundary of Michigan was because I happened to ta attach a sweet little essay that I wrote about raising chickens with my kids. I was divorced, I had a little farm, I was unemployed, and I had three sons under the age of 13 to raise. And I wrote about it. And I certainly didn't think I would ever show it to anybody. Because at journalism school, they beat that word I right out of you. You are not supposed to use that word I when you're a journalist because Nobody, wants, nobody that's reading the paper wants to know what you think. They want the facts, they don't want the emotions, and they, don't, they only want objectivity. So I was writing these sweet little essays, but I wasn't showing them to anyone. Until I started looking for a literary agent for a third true crime book. And on a whim, I attached an essay about raising chickens with my kids. And I did it because I wanted that agent to know I was trying to write literature. It might have been revolved around a crime, but I wasn't trying to write slasher books. 
I wasn't trying to write the blood and guts that you see on the front page of the paper. I was trying to write real, true human drama. And the only way I knew to communicate that to this agent was to attach that essay. So she called me. Uh, when I picked up my phone, she didn't even introduce herself. She said, you are not a true crime writer anymore. You're a memoirist. And I was so shocked by that statement that I actually said, excuse me, but I think you have the wrong number. <laughs> you can't possibly be talking about me. And she said, is this Marty Jo Link? And I said, yes, it is. And she said, well, I'm not interested in a regional true crime book. But if you can write an entire book, like that essay that you sent me, then I'm your agent and you have a readership. Because people are interested in stories about real people facing real obstacles and coming up with real solutions. And just what happens in ordinary lives can be incredibly compelling. So I worked with her for a while. She um, kind of coached me and gave me a series of memoirs to read, family, memoirs and family histories to read, because she said, one thing I've learned when I work with journalists is that they don't like to use the word I. And you really have to get over that if you want to write your family history, if you want to write um, anything about your own life or your family's life. You need to be a central character. You're a central character in your life day to day. When you write about it, you need to continue to be that central character. So I spent a year writing, and Bootstrapper is the result. It's a memoir about raising my three kids over that very difficult year uh, when, again, I was unemployed and I had a farm and it was my first year as a single parent. Um, so since doing that process myself, I know how rewarding it can be. And so that's why I wanted to offer this workshop to help other people feel that way too, feel that sense of accomplishment too. So there are. There are all sorts of reasons that you might want to write your family history. Maybe you want to document your family's experiences. Maybe you want to share that story with your children or your grandchildren or other relatives. Perhaps to discover some things about yourself. Simply for the pleasure of writing. And for those of you who aren't daily or weekly or monthly writers, really, it really can be pleasurable, I promise you. And even to get published. There is a big hunger for personal stories today. Uh, I almost think of it as a backlash to all the technology and all the fast-pacedness of our lives. There is a real hunger for real stories. So all of those reasons are valid. And these goals all have something in common. And I put this picture there. This is a picture of me when I was 12. My family had rented a cottage on Torch Lake in northern Michigan, one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. It was a sunny day, probably 80 degrees outside, and what am I doing? I'm sitting in a chair with a magazine reading an article or a short story. All these goals have something in common, and that is that they tell a great story. I would like you to seek to entertain first and educate second. Of course you want to educate your kids or your grandkids or your readers about who these people are and what they went through in their lives and what you went through. But the, the, the purpose of telling the story, if you are doing it for readers, as opposed to just for yourself and just sticking a drawer, is to uh, absorb them, to entertain them. We live in a world where people have many, many different choices for their free time. And so if you want them to read to the end, tell a great story. So before we get started tonight, and I am going to have some writing exercises for you, some early, some early advice. These are the things that people worry about most. These are the things that stop people from writing about their life. You're worried that you're going to make a mistake. You're worried that you'll hurt someone's feelings, intentionally or unintentionally. That you'll be sued, that's a big one. That you'll reveal too much. And my advice is address these issues later and for tonight and, be, and while you're working on something, 
just right. Just right. This is a quote that I have on my computer. And it's written by, of all people, J.D. Salinger. Someday there will be a story you want to tell for no better reason than because it matters to you more than any other. You'll stop looking over your shoulder to make sure you're keeping everybody happy, and you'll simply write what's real and true. Honest writing always makes people nervous, and they'll think of all kinds of ways to make your life hell. <laughs> One day, a long time from now, you'll cease to care anymore whom you please or what anybody has to say about you. That's when you'll finally produce the work that you're capable of. Write first to please yourself. And I am hereby telling you that you own your story. It doesn't belong to anybody else but you. And you can decide what to do with it. OK, so we are going to do a little writing exercise. And why not begin at the beginning? If you're like me, when I get a first sentence out or a second sentence out, I just feel this. I'm often rolling then. I'm often going. But sometimes you don't know exactly how to start. So I thought I would give some examples of how to begin. And this can fit whether you're, you intend to write a whole book or simply one personal essay. You can begin by describing something you see. That something can be a place, a person, an object. So that's one way. Describe something you can see. Another way is to describe an action. Have something happening. When all else fails, try dialogue. And sometimes you can even have a combination of these two. So I have a little confession to make, and that is that I was at the Kalamazoo Library last night. And as I was checking out of my hotel this morning, I had these three books on the passenger seat of my car. And I realized I forgot something. And so with my car door unlocked, I ran into the hotel to get the other item. And when I came out, these books were gone. So uh, and I have a feeling the person that nabbed them is probably not in this room taking this workshop. Um, so which is kind of a cool idea to think of a thief running around reading Spalding Gray's Impossible <laughs> Vacation. I just sort of love that idea. But I do have some stand-ins. So what I wanted to do was just read to you some truly fantastic beginnings of family histories. Um, I don't have Spalding Gray's Impossible Vacation, but courtesy of your library, I do have Rick Bragg's All Over But the Shouten. And uh, if you, you could do much worse than read Mr. Bragg. He has three books out. Every one of them is a gem. His first was called All Over But the Shoutin'. His second one was called Ava's Man. And his third one was The Prince of Frogtown. He has a lot to say, and all of it is just supremely entertaining. So I'm going to read to you the beginning of Mr. Bragg's All Over But the Shoutin', which is a memoir of his childhood in the South. And he starts it in a really surprising way. Redbirds. I used to stand amazed and watch the redbirds fight. They would flash and flutter like scraps of burning rags through a sky unbelievably blue, swirling, soaring, plummeting. On the ground, they were a blur of feathers, stabbing for each other's eyes. I have seen grown men stop what they are doing, stop pulling corn, or lift their head out from under the hood of a broken down car to watch it. Once, when I was little, I watched one of the birds attack its own reflection in the side mirror of a truck. It hurled its body again and again against that unyielding image until it pecked a crack in the glass, until the whole mirror was smeared with blood. It was as if the bird hated what it saw there and discovered too late that all it was seeing was itself. I asked an old man who worked for my Uncle Ed a snuff-dipping man named Charlie Bivens, why he reckoned that bird did that. He told me it was just its nature. 
So imagine starting a family history with a paragraph about birds fighting, red birds fighting. But doesn't it kind of set a mood? It was just its nature. And he goes on in the rest of his book to tell us a, about a lot of people and really the only motivation you can come up with for the reason some of these people did the things that they did was it was just their nature. It's a really pretty profound way um, to start a family history. This second book is called The Florist's Daughter by Patricia Hample. And she, you can tell by the, her title, The Florist's Daughter, how she sees herself. She sees herself as a daughter. So the book is very much about her mother. And here's how she begins. For once, no flowers. Past midnight and very quiet along this corridor. The clock on the opposite wall is round. A cartoon clock. Funny the idea of keeping time here of all places. Beneath the clock, a square calendar announces in bold what is now the wrong date, April 3rd. I could walk over just a few steps, tear the page away from the calendar, and make it today, April 4th. But that would cause a ripping sound, and I'd have to let go of her hand. So leave it. In this room, it's yesterday. We won't reach today until this is over, the time warp we entered three days ago. She'd appreciate that irony, being her last grasp on reality. This time, the doctor said in the hallway last night, it might have been two nights ago, you understand this time, this is it. So that's how she starts a book about her mother. So those are a couple of examples that I think are dynamic beginnings. They're attention getting, they're startling, they're not giving us a weather forecast. Patricia Hempel's giving us some dates, but she uses it in a pretty uh, interesting and, and original way. So what I'd like to do is take 10 minutes till 7.30, and I'd like you to write a beginning. Start with, and I'll go back to those directions again, the first ones. Describe something you can see, a place, a person, or an object. Describe an action, something is happening. And when all else fails, try dialogue. And don't worry if you don't remember like a tape recorder, because we're human beings. If you know a person, if you know how they tended to speak, if you know the kinds of words that they would use, the kind of inflection they would use, you remember who they are through their dialogue. So, so feel free to use dialogue if that's what you want to do. So that wasn't so bad, was it? That wasn't so painful, was it? Uh, anybody have any feelings about that exercise or, or um, I mean, it's pretty simplistic, but it worked. It got you all writing. So it's not as hard as you think. And, uh, you know, you can use this for beginnings of chapters. You don't have to use this exercise just to begin the work that you're talking about, if it's a book length or if it's a personal essay. If it is a book length work, consider using this every time you start a new chapter or if you get stuck. So it's not just for the beginning with the capital B. Paragraphs have beginning. Chapters have beginnings. Ch sections of books have beginnings too. Okay, so moving on. So what's next after you have your beginning? Uh, I like to write, my own method of writing is I write what's, what are called scenes. I don't think of the project in its ent entirety because if I did, I would curl up under my desk in a fetal position and do nothing because it seems so huge. So I try and write in terms of scenes. And by that, all I mean is that something happens. Something happens in a scene. Something begins. Something happens. There's an action. And the way to start that is think of an image in your mind. And if you're remembering something and it comes along with an image, you're remembering that image for a reason. I'll give you ex an example. I'm working on a book right now about women's friendship. And I have, that's a real general statement, but I have seven women friends and myself have gone to Drummond Island the same weekend, the same eight women for 26 years. We all met when we were either in our 20s or 30s and we were waitresses or bartenders. Now, um, we're not waitresses or bartenders anymore. We're 26 or 27 years older. 
we've all we've lost parents we've had children we've had children grow up we've had new marriages we've had marriages end we have faced illness we have faced corporate downsizing career success um, and and loss of our part some of us loss of our partners and so um, I, how do you sit down and write something with, that's so enormous? You, you boil it down to one event or one image. And the image that I'm working with right now is uh, the, the whole eight, all eight of us were on our way into this restaurant and I see us shuffling through this gravel parking lot and the image in my mind is one of us, my friend Linda was wearing a bright red turtleneck. Now when you're on Drummond Island and it's November and everybody's dressed in fleece and long underwear and down jackets and faded denim jeans and, and dusty boots, a red turtleneck really stands out. And I figure there's a reason that that image is in my mind. And it goes to who, she, who Linda was. And so I sort of go from there. So when you write a scene, that's what you do. You can start with an image and then try and figure out what that image means. Why is it that that's what you're remembering? Of all the things that you could remember of all the things that she could remember about um, right before she had a baby, why is it that she re remembered cutting off those shorts with a pair of scissors? It's pretty tactile. So um, the next thing that you do after your beginning is write a scene. And in a scene, something happens. The personality of either yourself or someone in your family that you're writing about is revealed, is shown their character, their personality. People are challenged and changed. Now this doesn't mean that people have to climb a literal mountain or that they're, you know, uh, have a complete personality shift. It just means that that event, whatever happens in that scene, means something. It's in your, it's in your work for a reason. It's in your personal essay for a reason or in your book for a reason. So we are going to write a scene from a photograph. And if you didn't bring a photograph, you can either look in your wallet, because there might be one there, or you can imagine a photograph in an album at home or in one of your photo albums at home. So with the idea of a scene in mind and, and making something happen, imagine who took that photograph. How did they take it? If it's a historic photograph, you know, people, people 100 and even 50 years ago didn't have a camera in their back pocket at all times. Having a picture taken was a special, it was a special event, it was a special occasion. So how did that, how did that take place? And if you don't know the answer to these questions, try and imagine. What was the occasion? Was it a wedding, a baptism, a new building, a funeral? And why was it important? Why do you have a photograph of it at all? To get us started, I have an example here. I actually used this exercise in Bootstrapper. This is the photograph. And let's see if I can find this section here. Um, these are my three sons, and they're standing at the edge of our driveway. And there was an incident in Bootstrapper when it was really important for me to get off of our property, and we had just had a huge snowstorm. We had what's called thunder snow, something that we really only get here in Michigan and a few other places in the world, which is like a thunderstorm, but instead of rain, snow falls, and usually a whole bunch of it. So um, I used this picture uh, to write this section. I'll just read briefly. Owen, Owen and Luke, you guys take one side. I'll take the other side. And Will, you clean up what we leave in the middle. We're shoveling, by the way. Let's start at the garage and work our way to the road. Don't try to shovel it all at once, because you'll just get tired faster. Take it in small scoops. That is the way we accomplish everything in small scoops. That's the way we stocked up on squash and froze extra vegetables. That's the way we've kept the fireplace stocked with wood. That's the way I've grown, gathered, and bought our food. And that's the way we will get this driveway shoveled. 
It takes us more than five hours. Our hearts are banging in our chests and we're all out of breath, sweaty and hot by the time we finish, even though it's barely 20 degrees outside. But we clear every inch of our driveway out from under all that snow. We stand together at the end where the driveway exits to the road, look back at our work and catch our breath. And for the first time in a long time, I'm proud of us. Proud enough to balance my camera on the flat hood of the farm truck, set the automatic timer, and take a picture. Looking at the image at my son's faces, I'm pretty sure that they're proud of themselves too. My memory of this day is dominated by smiles, by the sound of thunder snow, as well as the sense of heaviness that pressed down upon the morning. So that's from writing from a photograph. So let me, um, let me go back to the directions here. I, I, uh, I gave this workshop, I think it was in Owasso, and um, there was a woman in the back of the room and she, had, she brought in a photograph from her wall. I mean, it was big, framed on her wall. And it was her, a picture of her, it was a black and white photo, and it was a picture of her husband. And he was surrounded by cows. You could only kind of see his chest and all the cows. So when, she, when we did this exercise, she, she volunteered to read. And she read about how her husband had kept corn in his pockets so that any time he needed the cows to come, if one got out or, you know, he was a planner. And so he always did this ahead of time. He always had corn in his pockets. So if a cow got, got out, all he had to do was shake his pocket and all of the cows would come back. Well, uh, so she read this really moving piece about her husband and the corn in the pockets, and it was kind of funny. And when she finished reading, she said, um, I just lost him last week. So he had been gone for seven days, and she said, it's the first time that I've been able to even talk about him. So that's the power of writing about the people that you love and the people who are in your life, and, and from a photograph. I was really touched that she pulled that big, giant, framed picture off of her wall and brought it with, brought her with, brought it with her. So see if you can't write from a photograph. Tell a story from that, from that photograph. Um, we're going to go, we'll go about 10 more minutes. And again, just visualize a picture if you don't have one with you. Well, keep in mind that you can do this with almost every photograph that you have. So if you're getting stuck, uh, you can write from a photograph. Even if you don't, if you, were, if you were not born when the, say you have pictures that you weren't even in existence yet with some of those historical photos. You can say, I wonder, or I think. That kind of lets you off the hook for being necessarily um, perfectly accurate because you're bringing in your own feelings and your own questions. You know, you can write about a historical photograph that you didn't know any of the people in and just write about what you wonder about them. What are your curiosities about these people? And that is one way to write about people that you maybe that you didn't even know. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about how to do that, Rick Bragg's book, Ava's Man, is an entire book about his grandfather who he didn't, never met. An entire book. He interviews other relatives, friends, uh, and he surmises a lot. And yet it's a really moving account. He felt, he felt kind of ripped off because everybody told him what a fantastic character this guy was and how interesting and funny and fun and crazy he was. And here's Rick. He said, well, he died when I was one years old. I never even got a chance to meet him. And yet he wrote an entire book about him. So it can be done, even if you have pictures of relatives that you didn't meet. Allow yourself to wonder. Allow yourself to question that kind of stuff. So the next time you're stuck, you can also do this exercise and write from a photograph. Uh, this is the third, the third and final, or third and I guess I have four exercises, so here's the third one. Probably, uh, I could be wrong, but probably none of the people in this room are necessarily um, gifted artists, although maybe you are. 
But there is something that happens when you take your hand and draw something, a map, your childhood bedroom, your neighborhood when you were a young girl or a teenager, the campus where you went to college. There is something in the act of drawing that and trying to come up with the distances for that and where things were that really can jog the memory. So I'd like you to just take a few minutes and imagine a place. Maybe it was, um, you know, maybe it was your first house after you got married. If you grew up on a farm or if you have a farm now, maybe it is the, where the barn exists in relation to the house, in relation to the pasture, in relation to the driveway. Um, the, your childhood neighborhood is always a good one. I did that, and um, when I didn't even realize till I was finished that my house was, took up about three quarters of the paper, and everybody else's houses were just these little postage stamp squares. Because of course, you know, the house that you grew up in is so much more important. So, um, so think about drawing a place. Why did you choose it? What happened there? Why is it important? What are the smells, textures, sounds? What are some of the details? And I'll give you another example. This one is also, um, also from Bootstrapper. Let's see if I have the, there. Here's my drawing. As you can see, I am not a fantastic artist. So if I'm willing to do it and stick it up there and show it to all of you, you should, you should be willing to do it. That's the fireplace in my house. And those three images above where the sparks are going up, I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. Those are windows. I don't know what I was thinking when I drew this, because how could you have a windows on a chimney? It's, it just doesn't work that way. But in my mind, that's kind of how I saw the fireplace in my house. And there's, there's the rug in front of it, which looks like it, it could easily catch fire and burn our house down at any second. But it did, jog, uh, it did jog a memory. You can tell just by looking at it that the fireplace in our house wasn't an afterthought, but was built at the same time the house was, that it is part of the original design. The opening is wider and taller than that of any fireplace I can remember seeing in anyone else's house. The interior bricks that line the sooty cavity are old and chipped and carbonized black with a century's worth of fires. These bricks are big, too, closer to the size of a cement block than a regular brick. The deed on our farmhouse reads, year built, 1900 plus or minus. And I can picture a circa 1900 family gathered around it before the glass doors or the decorative green tile surround were added. In my mind, this family would be stirring something aromatic, bubbling inside a cast iron stew pot, warming their hands, drying their darned over wool socks, and maybe their hand-knit hand mittens, too. I cannot picture them roasting marshmallows here, however. Even if marshmallows were invented and readily available to farm families like in the Midwest northern hinterlands at the turn of the century, I'd like to think that the early inhabitants of my house would have known better. So that section came from, um, came from a drawing. So let's go back here and tackle this third exercise. How do you feel when you think of this place? Why is it important? What are the smells, textures, sounds? So draw your picture, draw your map, and see if that jogs any memories that, um, that have been stuck in there for a while. So we're, we're, um, we're at 8 o'clock, so we're just going to do like four minutes on this one. So what I'm trying to do tonight is just give you some exercises that you can take with you um, when you leave and that will work out of this room. There's nothing, nothing magical at all about that clock or my voice or these assignments. It's just somebody telling you to do it. So you're actually doing it. But with these exercises, you can, you can um, do that yourself. So from there, how do you end? 
how do you write an ending? Especially since, um, you know, your life isn't over and not, some of the people that you're writing about are perhaps still living. The goal of an ending is to give yourself and the reader a sense of satisfaction. Something has been finalized or put to rest. And I could add there, understood. No one has to die. Uh, you can close with both a sense of an ending and a new beginning. And if, you, if you're stuck, your ending can even be a wish. You can say, um, you know, I wish in the, I wish in the future, or I, I wish that my relationship with this person, or my dreams for myself are. You can end with a wish, because that kind of brings in that sense of an ending and a new beginning. So do you remember the, the reading that I did from Rick Bragg? Uh, Rick Bragg's all over but the shouting about the redbirds. So let's see how he chooses to end. Find it here. I was bad to sleepwalk when I was a child. I would get out of bed and slip through the house, then out into the night. I would awaken to the crunch and sting of frost on the soles of my feet, or in the summer to the sound of crickets and night birds. Once I walked all the way to my Aunt Nita's house, 50 yards away, knocked three slow times on the door, and turned around and shuffled back home again. A pint-sized zombie in pajama bottoms with horses on them. I was never afraid when I would awaken because the path, the trees, the dark outlines of the cars and pickups and small houses were all so familiar to me, and I have never been afraid of the dark, and I knew I would never be alone. The house we shared with my grandma wasn't big enough to afford my mama a bedroom, so she slept in the front room on the couch. The banging of the screen door would wake her, and she would follow me, not waking me because she had heard it was dangerous, that it was safer to just steer me back to my bed. But sometimes I would come to my senses outside and see her just standing there beside me. I never cried. I just looked up wondering. You're OK, little man, she would tell me. you just been traveling. He's such a master. And then um, how about the florist's daughter? When, we, when she opened that book, she, she um, had kind of gotten some, kind of got some bad news about her mother. And the whole book is about her relationship with her mother, which was a, a contentious one. Is it about me, she said, only a few weeks ago, asking what I was working on, always pushing me to work? It was the last time we really spoke. Her hand in mine, glass of Chardonnay next to her, the two of us sitting by the big nursing home aquarium. Is it about me? Sort of, I said, not knowing what venom this might draw. Not until this moment, hearing the avidity in the question. And Dad, and St. Paul, the greenhouse, and you. Of course you're in it. Good, she said, tough as Eddie Hadro in his green visor, the crusty Pioneer Press night editor casting his eye over my copy on my first newspaper job. Good, it's about time. She dropped my hand to reach for her glass. I like it here, she said, the view. We settled back in our deck chairs, just sat there side by side, taking in the bracing salt air and faced without dismay the gauzy hinge between sea and sky the limitless horizon dividing the elements, the disappearing point where we were headed. So a couple of examples of, of what I think of as really satisfying endings. I know it's probably hard to imagine an ending when you're really just beginning, <laughs> but I think it's an interesting exercise. It gives you a point to shoot for. Um, there's a novelist, his name is E.L. Doctorow, and when somebody asked him how he, how do you write? Do you have an outline? Do you know what's going to happen? He said, no, it's like driving at night. You don't know what you're go where you're going, you can't see where you're going, but your headlights will get you there. So if you can just see a little bit ahead. So try and imagine, just for the sake of this exercise and ending, 
try and imagine where you're trying to go with your work, with your book or your essay or your history or your memoir. Try and imagine how it could close because we can't really have 10,000 page books. <laughs> the trees are too valuable. So, so they, it really does have to end and for your own satisfaction too as the writer. So just take maybe two minutes and uh, you don't even have to write an ending, but maybe put a few words down that, would, that are the kind of feeling that you want when it's, when it's ended. Just a couple of minutes and then we'll, um, we'll close for some questions. And I hope some of these gave you exercises that you can take with you. Um, they helped me, and I hope that they'll help you. And they're not difficult. They're not difficult. What's difficult is the, is the um, wherewithal to sit down and actually do it. That's the difficult part. So good luck writing about your history. I am not a genealogist, and so um, I don't know how to research, do the research for your family history. I only know how to take what I lived and write about what I lived and I know what was helpful for me so I wanted to share that with you tonight and if, well I just I know you're all thinking this so I'm nobody asked it but I'm gonna t I'm gonna talk about it anyway and that is that don't be afraid what people are gonna think you know there is enough there are enough forces at work to keep you from writing don't be one of them don't be one of those forces I mean the laundry keeps you from writing the television set keeps you from writing. Your family obligations keep you from writing. Your job. Um, don't be one of those things that keep you from writing if you really want to do it. Write what you want to write, and when you're finished, that's the time to start thinking about whose feelings you might hurt and what you might get wrong. But don't think about that in the first draft, or you'll never really get your feet under you, and you'll never really get going. Don't go over to the dark side and be one of those forces that keep yourself from writing. So I hope you've got something that you can use um, beyond tonight, and thanks very much for coming. It was nice to see all of you. <laughs>